Hey guys, how's it going? Back for another video. Uh, recently, not that long ago, I did a video on Catholicism, and I was refuting uh, their belief in transubstantiation, and I've done videos on Calvinism, which I'm going to continue to do, but, you know, I get stressed out focusing on one subject, so I want, there's so many things that I want to cover, so I skip around from topic to topic. Anyways, this video is going to be on Moronic Mormonism, and I'm going to be talking about their belief in baptism for the dead. And so this was kind of interesting to me, and so I wanted to study it, and I got some Mormon books. I looked at what they had to say about it. You know, I've heard of this before. I've got, you know, books on cults that kind of cover it briefly and talk about things. I found out more about it from reading their actual texts. Here, I've got the Articles of the Faith that I found, uh, Missionary Reference Library by James Talmadge. So this is actually a Mormon book, which, you know, I want to go through a lot more because this talks about their doctrines. And it gives references to scripture, and I, you can also read about baptism for the dead and the doctrines of the covenant, and so I, and doctrines, doctrine and covenants. Sorry, so you know this is a book that you can get that has the Book of Mormon, doctrine and covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price all in one. So I found that at a thrift store. But uh, I was actually going to read from some of those, but I'm not going to. Um, it's not really that important. It is something that, you know, I want to go over in the future. I want to learn more about the history of these cults and stuff and, you know, exactly, you know, what their books say and stuff. But I just want to go over the scriptures that they use, you know, from real scripture and how they twist it. And I want to try to explain, you know, what these verses really teach. So basically, you know, uh, well, let's just, I'm just going to start here. I want to talk about, first of all, the idea that they teach that um, the dead can be preached to. So people who have died and went on to the afterlife, they still have an opportunity to be saved. Okay, so if they didn't, they say, if they didn't hear the gospel in this life and they died, they died without hearing the gospel, there's still a chance for them to be preached in the afterlife the gospel, and they can receive it. So, uh, that's obviously false, but let's look at the verses that they try to use to teach this. So let's look at First Peter 4, 6. First Peter chapter 4, verse 6. You know, and there's a lot more to this that, that I learned and maybe people didn't know. You know, there's basically one ma main proof text that they'll use for baptism for the dead that you, you might have seen, you know, if you've looked into this before. But there's more to it. I didn't know about, you know, how they teach the preaching to the dead, and it kind of ties in together with it. So, i got to find that here. It'll take me a little while. Hmm... First Peter chapter four verse six, so almost there. Okay. First Peter chapter four verse six says For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So wow. So, basically, you know, this sounds like it could be teaching what they say. They say, well, there are people who didn't receive the gospel in this life. They died without that. But they can be preached to afterwards. And this verse says, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. This sounds like there is a chance for people to hear the gospel in the afterlife. But that's not really what this verse is teaching. So, really, the basics of this verse is kind of talking about, like, martyrs, in a way. So, the way that it should be understood is that, For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, okay, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but living according to God in the Spirit. So, they're living. So, these are people who received the gospel, okay? And uh, we see all over in Scripture that once a person dies, their fate is sealed. And I'll talk more about that later. But there is no chance for salvation after death. 
But, so this is talking about people who are living according to God in the Spirit. So they must have received the gospel while they were living. So, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. It was preached to them before they are dead. So he's saying that these people are brothers and sisters in Christ. They're dead now. They have died probably for the faith, is what he's talking about, martyrs. So for this reason was the gospel preached to them who are died now, who are dead now, believers, who are killed because of their faith. They're dead now, but the gospel was preached to them before. And they're judged according to men in the flesh. Okay. So they are condemned of men because of their beliefs. That's why they are put to death. But yet they are living because they believed in the gospel. So it's not saying that the gospel is being preached to them after they're dead. It's saying that it was preached to those who are dead now. And because they received it, they are now living. Okay, so I hope you get that. Let's go on to the next one. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19. I've talked about this a lot. I'll talk about it a lot more because it has to do with this false doctrine called Abraham's bosom, which is basically like a Protestant version of purgatory, saying that um, <clears throat> the uh, saying there was a special abode for the saints in the Old Testament who had died. They didn't go directly to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom, quote unquote, because of the parable that Jesus taught. Where, you know, the rich man, the poor man, the poor man died and he went to Abraham's bosom. Which, you know, Abraham is the person and his bosom is his chest. So basically, you know, it's saying that he went where Abraham was, which is obviously with the Lord in heaven. But people take that to mean a certain place that's not quite heaven. So it's a purgatory in a sense until Jesus died on the cross and then they were taken to heaven. It's all false. I'm going to talk about that a lot more. And I have a study Kevin Zacker teaching it, which I'm going to break it down, and he uses more verses that I've never heard that he twists to try to use it. But anyway, so the Mormons will try to use this too. First Peter chapter 3, verse 19 says, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So, these people who believe in this false Abraham's bosom purgatory doctrine, this Protestant purgatory, that the Old Testament saints went to a place that wasn't heaven, but it wasn't hell. It was just kind of like a holding cell, is what they believe. And that when Jesus died on the cross, he went to them, and he preached to them, or he preached to... Um, <clears throat> or some people will also say that he preached to you know, people who have went to hell, and he was uh, proclaiming you know, his victory over them. Whatever way they look at it, this is false. So... Let's continue reading here in verse 20. So I'll go back to 19. It says, by which also. Actually, let's just go to verse 18 to 20. For Christ also hath once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, by, but quickened by the Spirit, by which the Spirit, just spoken of, also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So, this is kind of the same thing as what I read before. Okay. Being preached unto the spirits in prison. Okay. So, this would be speaking of people, the spirits representing people, by which, speaking the Holy Spirit, also, he went and preached unto the spirits, the people in prison, which I would probably say would be hell. So what this means, and it talks about Noah here, and how, you know, there was only few eight souls that were saved. It's saying that the Holy Spirit, through Noah, preached to men about salvation, and they didn't receive it, so now they're in prison. So by which also, by the Holy Spirit, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So he's not preaching to them now as they're in hell, but he preached to them before, and now they're in hell because they've rejected that message. So he went and preached unto them. Unto who? The people who are now in prison. That's basically how it's to be understood. I know it's somewhat confusing, but think about it and uh, go over it, and I hope that you can see that 
again, there's lots of scriptures that say that once a person dies, their fate is sealed. Okay, that's all there is to it. There's no preaching afterwards. There's no Abraham's bosom doctrine. You know, there's always been two paths. There's been the broad path and the narrow path. There's been heaven and there's been hell. Okay, there's been justification and there's been condemnation. So neither of these verses preach or teach what they're saying that the dead can be preached to. It's false, even though they may be convincing to some. There's another one that's pretty absurd, and they say that this verse that I'm going to read is a prophecy of the one that I just read. And so if the one that I just read doesn't teach what they say it does, then obviously the one that they're going to say is a prophecy of that doesn't teach what it does either. But let's look at it. Isaiah 24, 22. And this is their way, you know, a lot of people will do this. I mean, they believe this is true. This is what they're taught. But, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're trying to cement what they're saying is true even more by saying, you know, here's another verse of it. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. So let's look at this. Isaiah 24, 22. Isaiah 24 pages are stuck together. Oh, this reminds me of bags at work. Trying to separate grocery bags, they get stuck together. And okay, so 24 verse 22. It's right here at the end. Unfortunately, it's split in this Bible. But anyways, this verse says Isaiah 24:22, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered together are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. So it's mentioning a prison, <laughs> like the last verse did, it said that by which, you know, he went and preached to the spirits that are in prison. So we have prison there, and they shall be visited in many days, so that must be when he went and preached. So this verse is a prophecy of Jesus going to the spirits in prison, you know, the afterlife, and preaching to them. But, as I said before, the verse in First Peter doesn't teach that, and so neither does this. So let's look at the context here in Isaiah. And, you know, I don't know a whole lot about Isaiah and stuff. There are a lot of prophecies about Christ. But, you know, you got to be careful, too, when a lot of people are using all these Old Testament passages just saying, you know, this is a prophecy of this, that's a prophecy of this, this is a type of this, a type of that. Some of them are more clear than others, but there's a lot of abuse going on here with the Scriptures. So I want to kind of look at more of the whole context of this, and you know I can't explain all the details, uh, but I'm going to go through Isaiah 24, 16 through 23. So we're going to go back a little bit and, and go over it. So it says, From the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous, but I said, My leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously, yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Fear in the pit, in the snare, or upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. This doesn't sound good. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Sounds very, very negative, very bad. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison and after many days they shall be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients, ancients gloriously. So this is speaking of, you know, negatively <laughs> of unbelievers. You know, these, these kings on high or whatever, they're going to be brought down. And um, they're going to be, you know, taken as prisoners and visited. You know, and there's something interesting, too, I just want to note in some of the commentaries that I read about this when I was studying. 
as I thought it was interesting. Um, someone said that in verse 23 here it says, And then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion. Saying that the moon and the sun are kind of like symbols for unbelievers. Again, that, you know, uh, saying that the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed. Speaking of, you know, these um, high, high up people being brought down. That's very interesting to me. You know, that definitely takes on a different sense of it. And it's pretty believable because this is a really poetic passage here. This is very poetic, very symbolic. And, um, well, there's nothing on, in here of Christ speaking to people who have already died, preaching to them that there's salvation in the afterlife, okay, uh, for those who didn't receive it in this life. It doesn't teach that whatsoever. And so i got a couple of verses to show you that, you know, usually when visiting is being spoken of in Isaiah that it's a negative. So <clears throat> let's go to verse 26, or chapter 26, verse 14, just a little bit further over. It says, They are dead, they shall not live, they are deceased, they shall not rise. Therefore thou hast visited and destroyed them, and made all their memory to perish. A visiting doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound like, you know, Christ preaching to somebody in the afterlife and them having the opportunity to be saved again after rejecting him in this life. No. Visiting is negative. 29 verse 6. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 6. Well, how did I skip that? Okay, 28. There's 29. Okay, Isaiah 29, verse 6, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and with flame and devouring fire. Not a good visiting. But generally, I think, too, the idea here, because this whole passage is symbolic, it's poetic, it's talking about being taken as prisoners into a pit. So it's kind of like back in the days when people were jailed or in prison, they were put into like a dungeon and... Um, you know, they awaited to be, to be, uh, you know, judged. Basically, they awaited uh, for their, uh, whatever you want to say, their punishment. Okay. And so, you know, waiting was part of the punishment, but then there was, you know, they're going to be put to death or whatever else. They're just waiting that. And so you kind of like take the whole thing together. And the meaning is that this is just negative language. Okay. You know, woe to the, the inhabitants, you know, that are unruly, that, you know, are not followers of God. They're going to be destroyed. You know, they're going to be condemned. They're going to be taken as prisoners. And so, you know, it's just, and the, the fact that they'll be visited later, you know, you don't have to take it literally and try to, you know, figure every little thing out. It's kind of like taken together as this idea of, you know, being in prison and being judged and being condemned. But it has nothing to do with any kind of a, a prophecy of Jesus preaching to the dead, because Jesus didn't preach to the dead. Okay. So now let's get on to more of the meat of this, the baptism of the dead, because that's what this is all about. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at their main proof text. First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse twenty nine. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29 says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? I hear a whole lot of baptism of the dead going on here. It sounds like the Mormons could be right, right? I mean, this verse is pretty clear. It does say baptism for the dead. It says, why are they, or what else shall they do, which are baptized for the dead? Yes, if the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? Asking a question here, why are they baptized for the dead? Well, let's look at the whole context here. And there's a lot of debate over these verses. But certainly the Mormon uh, uh, interpretation is false. Some commentators have said that, you know, uh, 
Paul could be rebuking people who literally were baptized for the dead because, you know, maybe there were people before Mormonism back then that were doing this practice, and Paul's condemning it. But, you know, no commentators, you know, supported the Mormon interpretation because it's false, and it doesn't really matter what they say anyways. But I take a different approach on it. I don't think that's what it's speaking of. I don't think it's speaking of people literally being baptized for the dead. He's not condemning this practice even though that practice would be condemned because it's false. But what I'm saying is, let's look at the context of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 through 19. So let's go back a little bit further to verse 12. And we see that he asks some of the similar kind of questions. We can actually get the idea, the context of this verse right off the first one that I'm going to read here in verse 12. It says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So first of all, people are saying that there's no re resurrection of the dead. Okay, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how come you're denying the resurrection? How come you're denying the resurrection of the dead? So people were doing that. They're denying the resurrection of the dead. Let's continue. He says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching our, is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up. If so be that He, if, the, if so be that the dead not rise, for if the dead rise not, then not Christ, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, then our faith is in vain; ye are yet in your sins. And they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. Okay, but obviously Christ did raise from the dead. And uh, <clears throat> believers will follow, will be resurrected as well. But, let's go back to verse 29. Now that I've read the context, people were denying the resurrection, saying that there was no resurrection of the dead. And so in verse 29 he's saying, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead not rise, or if the dead rise not at all, why are they being baptized for the dead? What he's saying is, if you don't believe in the resurrection, then you truly are being baptized for the dead. Okay? You're not being baptized for belief in the resurrection. You're being baptized for the dead. You don't know. You're saying that Christ didn't raise and that nobody else is going to raise. So then truly your baptism is for the dead then why are you doing it for the dead? That's what he's saying. He's asking this question. He's rebuking those who are denying the resurrection, basically. Okay, if the dead don't rise, then you're being baptized for the dead. Why are you doing this? <laughs> but it has nothing to do with the Mormon practice of baptism for the dead. And so, I don't know all the details about it. Um, you read in the Doctrine and Covenants that you know, I don't know if it was Joseph Smith or who, somebody said, you know, there's this prophecy and in the temples we need to build like a baptism and uh, it says basically, you know, you know, uh, before I get into what I was about to say actually, let's look at this too because they go back in the Old Testament and they say this is a prophecy of what I just read, their interpretation of what I just read. So they think that... <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15.29 is proof for baptism for the dead. I just told you that it's not. Okay, It's Paul rebuking those who do not believe in the resurrection. He's saying, what are you doing being baptized then? You're being baptized for the dead. This is foolish. If you don't believe in the resurrection, there's no point in your baptism. <clears throat> so they go back to Malachi, and this is again interesting to me. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Malachi chapter 4, I think I was just there and then I just kept going. It's actually, I think, the last verse of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. The last two verses. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. 
Okay, so they're saying this is um, the sending of John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah, which you know a lot of people would agree with. But they're saying that he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, is saying that you know he's going to be teaching that the fathers will be baptized for their dead children, and the children will be baptized for their dead fathers. And that's not what this teaches at all. But what does it teach? Well, let's look at uh, where this is quoted in the New Testament. <clears throat> Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Because it kind of takes a different spin on it. It helps us understand the meaning of that verse. Luke chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. What is it? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh, come on. I can't get to that page. <laughs> like these pages are like wanting to stick together. I can't separate them. Okay. Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. I don't know if that's what I've been saying, but... It says, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit, in the power of Elias. Okay, that's what we've seen. To turn the hearts of their fathers, of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the children, to the wisdom of the just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So here we see, you know, the heart of the fathers to the children, and the children of the fathers. Instead of saying the children to the fathers, here it says the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So that's a little bit different here. Now we can kind of understand a little better. And in the previous verse, verse 16, it says, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And so, you know, who needs to be turned to the Lord? Those who are disobedient. And that's what we see in the next verse, the disobedient children to the wisdom of the just. So who are the fathers? The fathers are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the believers from before time. And so I think this whole idea of the fathers being turned to the children, the children being the fathers, kind of, again, it's, it's an all-encompassing idea here. And I kind of get the idea of like the prodigal son, too. <clears throat> but basically, it's that you know the disobedient will be turned to the wisdom of the just. Okay. He's going to make converts, okay? And they're going to uh, have their hearts turned to God just like their fathers from before time. Uh, you know, not maybe not their biological father, but their ancestors who believed in the Lord. Nothing to do with baptism for the dead. It's unbelievable. And so, as I was saying before, in the Doctrine and Covenants and stuff, you know, it says, you know, build a temple, and that's where we're going to do the baptism for the dead. And he says there needs to be a record kept of these. There needs to be a record of every baptism, you know, every person who's been baptized, you know, what person they were baptized for. So, you know, they teach this vicarious baptism to where, you know, I can be baptized for, you know, one of my dead grandparents or something, and, you know, saying if they didn't hear the gospel or whatever. And so... <clears throat> This also rests on the idea that baptism is essential for salvation. Mormons teach, you know, it works salvation. And they say that baptism is part of that. You know, as would the Catholics. But, so they talk about this record. And then they try to use Revelation 20 verse 12 to support this idea. So, let's go to Revelation 20 verse 12. Revelation 20, verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So they said, the works need to be recorded here on earth. And whatever is recorded here on earth is recorded in heaven. And so he's saying, you know, you know I was told of this, and we need to keep this record. This is the record that's spoken of in Revelation 20, verse 12. So, obviously that's foolish, it's not true, okay? And basically, I've taught that Revelation's an allegory, it's a big story, it's all symbolism, 
And uh, basically, you know, we're not to take this literally and get this idea that there's a book in heaven. How long, how big would a book be just written for one person's life, for all the deeds or whatever, if we're going to take this literally? That's insane. It doesn't even make any sense. It's absurd. It's not what's being taught here. This is symbolism. You know, like the mind of God knows all things. And so it's kind of like God's power, his omniscience, that's being symbolized with this book. <clears throat> But basically, I want to look at John chapter 5, verse 29, which is, you know, I think kind of somewhat relevant. There's lots of different verses I could look at. But let's just look at John 5, 29. John chapter 5, verse 29 says, And shall come forth, and they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And so there's two choices here. You know, uh, there's, you know... There's two sides. There's the saved, there's the condemned. And when it says done good here, it's those who have received the gospel, those who have done evil, those who have rejected Christ. There's the broad path, there's the narrow path. There's heaven, there's hell. And so, you know, once a man dies, they're either consigned to one or the other based on, you know, whether they receive the gospel or not. And so, there's no there's nothing there's nothing different being taught in Revelation with the books and stuff. It's just saying that all men are going to be judged and they're either going to be ju justified or condemned. Okay? Revelation is symbolism. The book is symbol symbolizing the omniscience of God. Okay? And, you know, he is the judge and there's two different sides. You know, the resurrection to life, the resurrection to dead has nothing to do with this book that Joseph Smith or whoever said that we're supposed to, the Mormons are supposed to keep track of baptisms for the dead. <clears throat> and so they have another verse to kind of explain how it teach, how they, how the baptism of the dead works. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. I'm almost finished here. Matthew chapter 18 verse 19 says again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them for my Father which is in heaven. That's not what I was looking for. I wonder what that verse is. I wrote it down wrong. Matthew chapter 18 verse 19. Let me look and see if I got it up here still. Just looking at notes that I've constructed on the website here. Uh, where is it? Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. Okay. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. Matthew 16, 18 and 19 says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And I've read about this for Catholicism before. They teach that Peter is the first pope. He's given the keys of the kingdom, which means that he kind of has the ability to forgive sins or to, you know, hold sins against people, which is absolutely false. And I've said that the keys of the kingdom are given to all disciples. The keys of the kingdom is the gospel. Whoever receives it shall be loosed. Whoever rejects it shall remain bound. But the Mormons take a little bit of a different spin on this. They don't teach that Peter is the first pope, but they say that whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. So if I'm baptized for somebody on earth, then they receive that baptism in heaven, okay, vicariously. Obviously, that's not what's being taught here. I just explained what it was. <coughs> and so uh, they also will use 1 Corinthians 15, 64 through 68. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 64 through 68, or wait, 16, 
that. Come on. Which one is it? Is that right there? 1, 2, 15. Oh, 46, 48. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46 through 48. Since howbeit that was not that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. So again, basically, you know, what we do on earth <clears throat> will be done in heaven. Is what the Mormons teach. So if we're baptized for somebody on earth, they can receive that baptism vicariously, and they teach that baptism is essential for salvation. So they're saying there's a chance for salvation after death. But no, Paul's just talking about, he's just saying that, <clears throat> that we'll have another body, okay? That we will be raised spiritually. It's a spiritual resurrection, okay? So that's all there is to that. And, uh, you know, I just want to read Hebrews 9, verse 27. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Hebrews 9, 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Okay? Once a person dies, their fate is sealed. It's either going to be heaven or it's going to be hell, and that's it. There's no more preaching the gospel. There's no more baptism. And first of all, baptism isn't essential for salvation. The thief on the cross died without being baptized. Jesus said that he would be with him in paradise, which is heaven. It's not Abraham's bosom. But that <clears throat> the thief on the cross, you know, was converted and saved and justified, and he wasn't baptized. You know, you got the saints in the Old Testament, and so on and so forth. Baptism is never essential for salvation. But once a person dies, their fate is sealed. And we see that, we see that with the Abraham's bosom parable. That, you know, when the rich man died, he went to hell. When the poor man died, he went to heaven. You know, Paul said that he, you know, he's ready to be with the Lord after he dies. You know, there's, so there's two places, there's no more chances after. Okay, and so that's why, you know, it talks about preaching the gospel, getting people converted, you know, as an urgency in this life for people to receive Christ today. So, very interesting study. I hope you learned something and um, be aware of, you know, the false cult of Mormonism. I want to talk about it a lot more, a lot of other practices and beliefs that they have. But um, that's it for the baptism of the dead. I feel like this is probably drug it out way too long, but we're almost at 30 minutes. But thank you for watching if you stuck with me. And uh, I'll leave the link to the study, which isn't quite finished, but it's there. And uh, I'll be moving on to another subject. But thank you guys. I pray that, you know, this will help you, that the Lord will help you to understand the scriptures and to, to spot out lies that people tell. And uh, <clears throat> thank you. God bless.